be with you. Reading from the Holy Gospel according to you. Jesus departed to the mountain to pray, and he spent the night in prayer to God. When day came, he called his disciples to himself. From them he chose twelve, whom he also named apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, the son of Alphaeus. Simon, who was called a zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Andrew, uh, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon who was called a zealot, and Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who was called came to trade. And he came down with them and stood on a stretch of level ground. A great crowd of his disciples and a large number of the people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And even those who were tormented by unclean spirits were cured. Everyone in the crowd sought to touch him because power came forth from him and healed them all. The Gospel of the Lord. I know I'm getting old when I skip a whole two lines. <laughs> I need new glasses. Oh, anyway. As I read this gospel last night to prepare for my homily, as we hear the call of Jesus to gather the men that he is going to have as his apostles to become the, the priests, uh, the future priests, the new priests of the covenant, it reminded me of my past, oh, like 30, 15 years ago, when I first became director of vocations and seminarians for our diocese. And it was my mission, my individual vocation at that time, to help others discern their vocation, the calling that God has for them to become priests. And I also handled a side calling for deacons and for religious as well. But pre predominantly, my, my particular work for the diocese was for the priesthood. So I went into all the different schools, and as I preached to all the kids of different ages, from the grade schools to the high schools, you know, of course they were too young to know about what they were going to do in the future, but to at least discuss it so they knew that the time was going to come eventually when they wouldn't have to figure out what they were going to do, and and uh, plant the seeds already for a vocation. And I said to them, all of you are in Catholic schools, but I guarantee you that most of you have parents who will treat you like parents for the children who go to secular schools. I said, and what I mean by that is this, as you get older, and if you haven't heard it already from your parents, they're gonna tell you, what do you want to do when you grow up? And that's how most parents handle their children's future. And I said, but your parents will be wrong in that. And I want you to remember the truth now as you get older. And that is this. That the first question that you ask yourself is not, what do I want to do? I said, that's a secondary question. The first question that all of us should ask is, what do you feel God is calling you to do? because God's will should always be discerned first. And even among the guys who would come to the diocese who were older and thought God was calling them when they were ready, I would tell them, after they've discerned what God wants them to do, I say, the second question then is, what do you want to do? And you'll be answering that question through the years in seminary. You know, hopefully you've discerned now, God is calling me, so you've answered that first. And now you say you want to, but you may change your mind. Throughout the years of seminary, you may say, I don't want to do this. 
because half the guys who come into seminary end up leaving. Only about half get ordained nowadays. It was even worse of a percentage when I was in seminary. And so the first thing we discern is what is God's will, and then secondarily, what is my will. But as Christians, we are in that lifelong journey to conform our will to God's. But whatever we choose, if we choose to do our will above God's and say no to what God is calling us to do, God will still honor that. He always does. He gives us free will. But of course, it's just a lot easier if we follow and do God's will first. So that's the first thing that we have to discern. And of course, we pray that every day, don't we? When we say the Our Father, we say, Thy will be done. And in fact, it's structured about the first half is, it's, you know, talking about God. Your name is holy your kingdom come, your will be done. And then after we've established that, the second part of the Our Father is then caring about what we want, right? Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. We forgive our trespasses against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. So we talk about God's will first in that prayer, and then what we need second. As I read through the gospel last night, it occurred to me, that I'm sure Luke didn't plan it this way when he wrote it, didn't think about this, but the structure of this pericope that we are using in the Gospel today also follows that same structure. In the beginning of the reading, the first half, is about God's will. Jesus calling his 12 to become his apostles. And then after that has been established, when God's will is now finished, now we look at what the people want. And it says immediately after choosing his 12, he's already dealing with people who are wanting to come to him to be healed. They want something from God. And they say, if we just touch him, you know, we're going to be healed. So this reading goes from God's will first to everybody else's will secondarily. And that should be the right proper way. But it would behoove us to listen to the names of all 12 who have been called. The last one mentioned is Judas Iscariot. And I'd like to make the comment that God calls everyone to serve him in one way or another. Everyone has the same opportunity, the good and the bad alike. Jesus makes a comment at one point in another gospel that our Heavenly Father lets the rain come and fall on the heads of the good and the bad. God loves all of his children. He even loves Satan. A lot of people get shocked when they hear that. But God cannot not love Satan. He loves all of his creation. No more, no less, just because we do his will. And Satan is just as loved by God as we are, as the saints in heaven. But nevertheless, the point is that God has called all of us at some point to do his will. Even those who later on will say no to God, as did Judas. And I say this because there are people who are worried about their own worthiness to be called by God. And one of the things I'd always say to the seminarians, you know, even before they became seminarians, those who were discerning and said, you know, one of the things, the reasons that they kept them from going into the seminary was that, well, I'm not worthy enough. And I'd say, you're right, you're not. You're not. And I'm not. None of us is worthy. But yet God still calls. We can look at all the just the kings alone in the Old Testament times. They were good and bad ones. Even David was both good and bad in what he did. And yet God still called him. So never fear that you feel you're not worthy. God is still calling you. The last point I want to make is from Janine. This morning as she was talking about what's your homily going to be on, I said, well, the reading is on the call of the 12 apostles. And she said, oh, that's the great homily. You know, what is God calling you to do? So, basically, each of us has a calling. Now, of course, this gospel passage is about the calling to become priests, the calling of his 12 apostles. And in my work, it was to help, help those to understand their call from God. But that's a particular call in our way of life. We have the sisters here among us, right? This is their state of life to which God has called them. Most of you are married. So we have the vocation among each of us that's different, one of three. Priests, religious, and the single life. 
But then, yet, as Janine was referring to, each of us has another type of call. That God calls all of us on a regular basis, every single day, to do His will. And throughout our whole lives, we will be called by God to answer His will to serve Him in one way or another. But ultimately, whether it's a call to the way we live our lives, a call in, no, just in serving God and each other throughout our whole lives, there is one call that answers that question, Janine, universally among all of us. And it is the same answer and the same call that we all have. And that is simply to do the will of God. And that takes a lifelong journey to do that. So in all things, we must discern first and foremost what is the will of God. And all of us have the obligation as believers in God to do His will before our own.